mean, maybe one way to start would be to talk about the genesis of the project and how you approached Dan and Ecclesiastic and that reservation. We both live in Oakland, and I was publishing comics, and uh, I wanted to do a project with them, but um, I'm not really sure how that fit in because he has several publishers. But there was a, a woman in the, in the Bay Area where we're from um, named Susan Miller, and she approached Dan about doing a museum exhibition. Um, and it started in Oakland, it just closed recently, and it, it will be touring, and it will be here at the Corcoran, I think, at the end of the next year. Um, so along with you, the idea was to have some sort of catalog for the exhibition. And so this opportunity to do this book came up. And we started that probably about five years ago. And um, it was great. It was longer than that. <laughs> yeah. It was one of those projects, it's like Alvin and this woman Susan approached me, you know, about doing this museum show and this monograph. And I, it was one of those things I thought, well, you know, that's not going to really happen. but. You know, I, I'm lonely working all the time, and I, I like both of them. You know, I like Alvin, like Susan, you know. It'd be fun to have somebody to hang out with. And they used to come over all the time. We'd have these meetings, and there were like spreadsheets and lists of, like there were always, they, both of them would come over all the time and measure my art, and I would sell that. That was really a, like an existential nightmare to be like trapped in some guy's closet with, you know, it's 25 cm, and, uh, and so, you know, it, it didn't even seem like a real thing, and I, I never thought about it like, one day this will come out and I'll have to worry about it. You know, I just thought like, well, it's fun to have people in my house every, you know, every once in a while. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, we have a publisher, and it's like, it's going to come out. And I started looking, you know, I just let them look through all my stuff, just like, you know, go through the drawers and, you know, in, in my, you know, go through the medicine cabinet. You know, Alvin, I'd always hear Alvin in, like, in my closet, you know, I'd be like pretending to work and I'd hear Alvin in there going like, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I always think, oh my god, what did he find, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's like, it's like, oh yeah, I forgot I was in the clan for a few years, or you know, it's like, what, what did he find, you know, and, uh, and then I go in, and it was always, you know, something I hadn't thought about in many, many years, for good reason. You know, it's, I tried to block all this stuff out of my mind. So it was, but you know, Alvin is a very good friend. He's a person I really trust, and so it was, you know, he's like the only human being I would allow to to have that kind of access. You know, he's he's uh, he's somebody who I knew would uh, would not. You know, just trying to steal stuff and sell it on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're very generous. I mean, because I, I know you aren't, you're so distanced from some of your older stuff. I'm like, a few years going on, you know, just kind of pretty great about letting all the stuff. So well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of stuff I said, no, that will not be seen in this book. <laughs> but that's all I really had to do with the book. I really, it was all his, his thing. It's, it's very interesting to talk to these two guys on stage because these guys know more about me than I do, <laughs> literally. Like I will, I will, uh, I'll think, uh, I'll write a line of dialogue and story or something, and I'll, and I will actually like email Ken. Like, have I ever used this before? And he'll go, yeah, that was in you know David Warren page forty six, and then you used a version of it later in another story. You know, it's, it's like I don't think about my old stuff at all. I just. It's like once I've done it, it's it's like out of my system, and it's it's very so it's, you know talking to these guys is very strange. <laughs> we, um, for this book, I'm just going to go briefly through the what it's made of. Um, we got to work with a really great team. Um, the first person that comes to mind is Jonathan Bennett. He's a cartoonist, um, a really great cartoonist, and he designed the book. Um, and I'll just go through some of the chapters. We have different writers, including Ken. This is, just a, this is just an opening spread um, showing his, the inside of his plot files. This is the title page. And then the we share it again. Page 35. We got to work with a, a wonderful woman um, in LA named Christine McKenna. She's just done some of the best interviews with amazing people. And I'm really happy with what she did for this. 
And then uh, this is Ken, like a smaller piece of Ken's that was just on the 8-ball era when he was doing the comics. So. And then Chris Ware wrote um, uh, an essay for it, and um, just as a, as a friend and a cartoonist. And see, Ray Pride is a film critic in Chicago. who talked about movies and movie influences. And this is Ken's part. And, and um, I have some more stuff if you want to talk more about it later. Sure. Want to talk about yourself, Ken? <laughs> or what? You yes. Do <laughs> and then this is Susan Miller, who was the curator for the exhibition. And then Chip Kidd, um, who's a well-known designer, um, wrote uh, about graphic design and storytelling. It's pretty clear that I just basically browbeat a bunch of my friends into writing stuff. So Getting <laughs> 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 outsiders involved in this. So. Um, yeah, I was just, uh, did you want to ask me on some questions and I can flip through the pages? Sure, sure. I mean, I can, well, actually, why don't you flip through the pages? Okay, so this is a, this is during Chris Dean's interview, and then some, some of the juvenilia from when like, Dan was very young to in high school. And then uh, there's a um, section on the New and this is a studio uh, in Oakland, and um, from the 8-ball chapter. And this, this is an interesting section, uh, a story in a ball called The Stroll, and it, we included some of the photographs that you referenced pretty closely to, so you can see the, where you got the images from in Chicago. Right, basically. And this is, this is from Ken's part, where he really breaks down the panels, and it's just like I've read Dan's story so many times, I'll just, it feels like I've never let him, he just really breaks it down this time. Ken, Ken is the only writer where I'll read one of his essays and I'll think like, oh, I gotta read this story, that sounds really good. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things that I was trying to do, and then it's become kind of odd, like praising the Dan sitting right here, but I wanted just to talk about how sort of complex and intricate the work was, yet at the same time, it, you know, he uses these very friendly, familiar cartoon kind of surfaces, something a little Harvey comic or it won't be that different in its sort of design or coloring to something like a Richie Rich in a way. But yet he has these incredibly complex narrative strategies and formal strategies. And so I wanted to sort of alert people to um, part of what Dan was doing in the post uh, David Bourne work, right? And a lot of the stuff seems like it's much more influenced by past comic strips than some of his earlier work was. So I wanted to sort of talk about it. Those dynamics that work in this comedy. He's done a lot of illustrations of them over the past 30 years, and we did some. And this is these are the sort of illustrations that you give. Um, he's also done a lot of album covers, and there's a section on that redesign. And some sketchbook pages. Oh yeah, and here's a few photos from the exhibition in Oakland. I uh, work with uh, Nicholas. Do you want to show? Do you want to show? Nita and Hester Shaw have done. Dan made these drawings, and you can't say what. Maybe you can say, you know. Luckily, I don't have them. They use like a router, a computer router, to go into like, these walls, these installations, so they use such drawings for that. There's a lot of great stuff going on. You can see it better here, where they made a couch. On the other side, there's a, a sliding panel with this other with the original work. One thing that I wanted to ask Dan about the uh, show was that there's a there's a, a brief interview with you on the web, and it's someone uh, talking to you about the show, and you're talking about what it's like to sort of be inside this sort of square room with all your work, which means you kind of look uncomfortable and unnerved a little bit. But I wonder if when you look at any of your drawings, do you ever say like, oh, like wow, what a great gun I drew, <laughs> David Boring? Or do you say, oh, I wish I had adjusted the size of his mouth? I mean, do you ever it's mostly the latter, but um, I found, you know, I never see my artwork from more than, say, eight feet away. Like my studio, I couldn't get farther away than eight or 10 feet. And so I'm, and usually I'm wearing glasses and I'm looking at it very close and it's, I, it just looks so sloppy. Like I actually think my work is being really like sloppy and freehanded and you know freeform. And then when I see it on the wall, I'm like, oh my god, it's like some psychopathic, you know, like a malfunction. 
Canadian computer drew all this stuff. <laughs> But, but to me, it, when I'm doing it, it doesn't feel that way at all. I'm doing it kind of like fast, and like especially when I'm lettering, I'm just writing as fast as I can. Like I'm doing like it's like I'm signing checks or something. <laughs> and and then you see it on the wall, and it's like it's very rigid in in a way that I don't see at all. So it's I don't know. It's interesting to see it across the room, and it doesn't. Just because it works on a page and reading it, you know, sitting on your lap, it doesn't necessarily work on a wall. You know, it's a very different set of expectations. So it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. I like that it wasn't too out of context. They made this long drafting table and kind of styled that after the, the drafting table that Dan works on. And all of the books were there, so it wasn't too far. I like what these things were made and went too far from it. There's also these tables with a lot of books on it. I mean, my basic goal was to trick museum goers into buying my books. <laughs> that was, I thought, you know, a lot of people go to the museum, and probably nobody, you know, 99% of them have never read comics, and certainly not my comics. So if I can, you know, get get those people that have lots of disposable income to go, you know, go to the bookstore, I've done my part. <coughs> when you chose the pieces, what were what, what was your thought process? Was it I'm only going to choose art from books that are available in the store? Sell them, or was it just <laughs> yeah, that it wasn't quite that crass, <laughs> Kim? <Kimber. laughs> <laughs> that was a nice uh, attempt at a joke. I, you know, luckily I still have almost all my artwork from like Coast World on. So I had everything to choose from. And so it was really just a matter of like picking the best pages or the pages that had, you know, had the most impact or had, you know, had some meaning beyond just the, the artwork. But in some, in some cases, it was just a page I, I particularly liked out of the bunch or more to the point that I, that I didn't hate out of, out of uh, you know, sequence. Did you pick the panels that go in at the bubble? Was that Nicholas? No, I did that. There's okay. it's a, it tried to have a little semblance of narrative in the thing, so I picked these kind of sequences yeah. from stories that go across the, the top of the wall in the, in the show. And this show will be in Washington, D.C. at the end of next year, so. And it'll be in Chicago in between. In, yeah, next summer. Oh. Oops. <laughs> Coming right ahead. Um. See, uh, just to sort of shift topics, I wonder, you know, um, if you talk a little bit about your adapting Wilson for the screen. And then yeah. Talk a little bit about that process and the process of turning a comic into um, a screen for versus so you try to use something explicit in the whole Well, I was about a year or so ago, I was asked by the director, Alexander Payne, to adapt my book, Wilson, into a movie script. And he didn't really offer any uh, any ideas up front. He just said, you know, do like do something, and then we'll work on it from there. And I was, you know, the thing that's interesting to me in writing a movie script, especially a story that I've already done, is to kind of like rethink the character and think of different ways to do it and to try to make it somewhat fresh. And so I was. Uh, I was just, you know, I was trying to think, like, what what can I do to this story to make it, you know, a, a different thing, but it's also the same thing somehow. And, and I wound up writing all kinds of different versions of it. And he read it, and he liked all the stuff I'd written, but he was like, you know, I just really love this book. I really want it to be this book. Like, how can you capture that? And I kept going back to the book, and I, I wound up almost cursing myself. You know, I was like, this asshole cartoonist, I have to follow this. And and uh, and then you know we we kind of came to a synthesis of, of the book and what else I had written where it it really feels very much like the book but it's it's also very different in a lot of ways but it was a really interesting thing to have somebody try to work that sort of biblically like you know you've left out this little thing and you know I think I just I wrote that you know sitting in my underwear at ten in the morning without thinking about it twice you know it's, it's a very strange experience. The book is drawn, like each of the pages is drawn in a different style. And, and was there any sense of like, how you would try to capture certain shifting scenes or moods, or did you just leave that up to like, 
director. You know, that's yeah, that's not a writer's job, really. You know, and, uh, directors have told me that any time a writer writes, you know, like, you know, the, the, the guy looks up at the sky and there's an eerie purple light, or so they just like cross that out. You know, and anything like where a writer is trying to be descriptive is just, you know, not that's that's not their job. But I don't know. He, he and I sort of discussed like, you know, how how could we reflect the shifting styles? And we decided that's that's not really appropriate for a movie, I think. And so it just seemed really corny. You know, I think reading the comic, nobody notices the shifts after a while. They're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I've talked to a number of people. And, um, when, I remember uh, when Carol Kina interviewed the New York Times, right. she said she had read through the entire book and didn't notice that you were shifting at all. And that's yeah, it's like when she got to the end, she's like, wait a minute. Here he has a huge yeah. nose. And is that, I mean, when someone reads it that way, does that feel like a little bit of a, a triumph for you, like you've done something, you know, that you spread? Not that you've gotten something yeah. over on something, but that you've been able to influence people in a way on their I guess, I mean, anytime somebody reads it without staying on the surface, you know, anytime somebody reads it and it's sort of like they ask me about the people in the comic, you know, as though they're real people, that's that's when I've succeeded, you know? It's like, to me, the best comics are ones where you, you know, you start reading and then you're in that world, you're in the panels, and then, you know, 32 pages later, you're like, oh yeah, here I am in my room, you know, sitting, looking out the window, or like, you know, it's, I like it when you're just immersed in that world. Like, I mean, Hernandez's comics are really immersive in that way, where you just feel like you're walking on those streets and you're, you're in there with the characters, and then all of a sudden you're, you realize, no, I'm just looking at these drawings. I mean, are there things that you do to try to make sure that that's more like it happened, like when you were talking about on the barn You said, you know, you would never put, you know, a large word balloon because it would make the character feel like they were a, sort of a mannequin just uh, speaking a long kind of monologue. Are there other things that, that, like, either when you see it in somebody else's work, or you say, like, I'm never going to have four people talking in one panel because it's going to be too confusing. You know, there's certain, like, you know, it's just basic things of, like, having the, you know, if a one character talks first, you want to have their balloon be the one you read first, you know, it's the, sometimes you see comics where you can't tell which you're supposed to read, and, you know, just the basic thing, but I'm always trying to to write around things like that to, to see what you can actually do, you know, it's, it is very hard to have a character deliver a monologue in one panel without looking ridiculous. You know, there's a there's a uh, European comic called Blake and Mortimer, and it's every third panel is a guy explaining like the history of some long feud or something, and it's always like just this general standing in a panel that's going like this. You know, this guy's <laughs> huge. You know, but he's, all you can imagine is the guy is just frozen in, you know, like a puppet. <laughs> Alvin's done. He's checked out. He's <laughs> on his next book. I had a quick question about how you choose commercial projects. Projects like we did a lot of art for this. Uh, very interesting club in Paris called Mondrovice. Everything from uh, signs and logos to pizza bikes. And <laughs> the, well, that was, the, originally, I was contacted by this French-speaking uh, guy who ran that this club. He, they had done the they had allowed David Lynch to design a, a nightclub in Paris. It's like the Club Silencio, and I had been reading about that literally like days before this guy contacted me. He said, you know, we're doing this club and we want to have characters that look like they're out of your early eight ball comics. I thought, does he has he like actually read my early eight ball comics? And I said, you know, I want to make sure, you know, do you know who you're talking about? He said, well, my favorite of your characters is Pogi Bay. It to be like that. And I thought, well, okay, I could go for this. But then the if the language barrier was so strong, the guy basically I thought all I had to do was draw a poster for the money, and I thought, okay, well, that's, I can do that. And uh, and so I do, did the poster, and then he was like, and now you have to do the napkins and the pizza boxes and the blow-up, it was literally like hundreds of things, and I was like, what? 
I thought it was just a poster. <laughs> that was a lot of money for a poster, but so I it was like spent many months after that trying to you know, do all this other stuff. But it was kind of fun. It's fun to do stuff in Europe that you never have to see because it's just you don't even know what it is really. You know, we're all not like everybody hates me for doing that, but how would I know? You know, it's. It's like doing a logo for Walmart or something. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that in interviews you had talked about wanting to design things like tile boxes. I love that idea of being, you know, being having that kind of applied art. I like to go in the in the grocery store and buy buy everything just based on the design of the. <laughs> I have lots of food in my pantry that I'll never eat because of that. <laughs> so, uh, this is your uh, first SPX. I was wondering if you had any uh, favorite convention <coughs> stories from the past. Favorite convention <laughs> stories? <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was such a different world. You know, I used to go to lots of conventions back in the early eight ball days. Because that was like the only, you know, I used to like, basically make a living just selling my own conventions. Like, it's basically like being a guy who goes to art fairs and sells their watercolors or something. And, um, and I was trying to think, you know, when was the last time I was in a thing like this where you're you're like trapped in a hotel? Like you like like I haven't left the hotel today. <laughs> and I was thinking like it was back when they used to have this thing called the Dallas Fantasy Fair in Dallas and they would invite people like me and the Hernandez brothers and Robert Crumb and you'd find yourself like, you know, just sitting with Art Spiegelman and all these guys in the middle of a, the crummiest like Marriott Hotel in Dallas where nobody was interested in us. We had like five people from used to do this every year there was this couple of an elderly couple who would bring banana bread to all our highlight of the thing. And so it was it was just such a different world. The only reason you'd ever go to a convention is there'd be some crazy guy who thought you were going to draw fans and they would fly you out and then they'd be sorely disappointed. Do you miss that world in any way? You know, it's fun to think back on it, but I, I'm not sure if like, I was invited back to the Dallas Fantasy <laughs> Fair. <laughs> yes, I've got to go. I don't think I was wondering about, are there any Sometimes your characters get such diametrically opposed reactions from fans. Some people will say, oh, Wilson is me, and I love him, or Wilson is such a jerk. Do you feel like there are certain characters that, like, there's the people that I feel like it's always 50 50. Like half the audience is with the character and the other half is. And I'm always sort of ambivalent about You know, I'm not. There's no. I've never done a character that I really hate. And most of them I love in some way. Like that's my goal is to find a way to love them by the end of the story or the end of the book. But, you know, but I can certainly see that, you know, that they're off putting in many ways. But Wilson was a funny one because the people who really and most were like the closest to Wilson. Like they, were, they were those who made Wilson seem like a plausible character. If there are people like that, then Wilson is, you know, is a realistic person. I like Wilson right from the beginning though. <laughs> but um, 
but so I thought, oh, this is going to be great. You know, I can just sort of subtly make him look like the creep that he is. And uh, and I finished the illustration, and I go, oh, it's great. Everybody loves it. And then uh, and they get an email, and it's like, well, I think Glenn Beck might have seen the drawing, and he decided to pose for a photo instead. <laughs> Sadly, it was not used, so. And now, I, mean, I thought, look, well, maybe somebody else will do an article about Glenn Beck and I can use that, but now that he's sort of, I think he's kind of over it. Yes. <laughs> when you did the happiness poster for that time, so you, you had to, there was a lot of grief on the faces and that, wasn't there? Well, that was, it, it, most of the time you do a portrait and that's, you know, the only person who has to approve it is an art director. But when you do a movie poster, every actor has it in their contract that they can approve their likeness on the poster. And so, you know, here's a poster for a Todd Salons movie, and I'm drawing people like Louise Lasser and, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. And uh, and they, every actor was like, how dare you draw me with crow's feet? Like, actually, they had to white out Louise Lasser's crow's feet. Like, You're 80 years old. You know? <laughs> I think you look like Miley Cyrus. You know, the, you know, the, the most vain guy was John Lovitz. Was like, <laughs> you made me look, you know, like you made me look like I have a double chin. And I was like, hey, that's like your trademark. You know, like, <laughs> and, and I actually, in that movie, there's no real star. It's all, you know, people have kind of an equal amount of screen time. But Philip Seymour Hoffman was like so cool about his, he didn't care at all about his thing, so I was like, slowly make him bigger and bigger. Yeah, I wanted to like, that, yeah, the original, I was like pasted on stats and all these redrawings and stuff, and it's literally like this high, if you look at it from the side. I was gonna like, Dismantle it, you know, put it in the show, and I realized like, you know, it's true, it's like fall apart, and you know, I need some forensic scientist to deal with it. Uh, we'll probably take questions in a little bit, but before we do, um, I wanted to ask you about strange interview scenarios that you've been involved in, and uh, if there are any that uh, you want to share. Strange rule, this one. <laughs> the witch. Oh yeah, that was a good one. Right? I got my uh, the, one of the people who was doing publicity had got me an interview with some film magazine, and I thought, oh, okay, I'll talk to the film magazine. And the guy is like, so you're working on any films? And I was like, yeah, you know, I might be doing this thing with Alexander Payne. And he's like. Oh, I don't know who that is. I feel like a film magazine. He's like, he's like nominated for a lot. He's won the Oscar many times. And did this movie, The Descendants. He's like, oh, I've never heard of that. <laughs> good. You gotta love that. No, I never saw it. I think it's probably just some guy calling me. That was the thing I learned in you know, years ago, is that it's very easy to get an interview with just anybody. Like, you could get an interview with, like, Gwyneth Paltrow easily, just just to say, just, like, start your own website, do a couple interviews with anybody, and then just call up some publicist and say, like, yeah, I'm doing it for this website, and they don't, they don't check. <laughs> done interviews with so many people that I know just, like, were pretending to record it, and, and then went home, like, I kind of mentally talking to you for an hour. <laughs> That's what that story um, in the book of other people is kind of about, that Justin at the end of the time. Yeah, that was sort of based on a guy who was so <laughs> like that. But I did, well, I did an interview recently with the, the Guardian newspaper in, in the UK, and it was, it was an email interview. And you, you sort of learn to be generous in an email interview, you know, because you could just very easily answer in one word answers, but you, you learn to, you know, try to turn it into an interesting couple of sentences so that it looks like a real interview, you know, because if you're talking to somebody in person, you tend to be a little more voluble, you know, and so I, I did all these anecdotes, and I remember, you know, it's all these kind of stupid, rote questions, like it was, you know, if you could go back in time, what would you do? And I said, you know, I. 
I said something like, I'd, I'd like to say, I, you know, go back and kill Hitler or, or you know, ascertain the divinity, divinity of Christ. But in reality, I would probably go back to my childhood and, you know, buy a bunch of the stupid toys that I found. <laughs> you know, it was something like that. And, and I had a bunch of long answers like that. And then when the interview came out, it, obviously the format was that these are very short answers. So it, it said, you know, if you go back in time, what would you do? And it just said, I'd like to kill Hitler. <laughs> yeah. 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 And somebody said, like, everybody says that. And I am said, well, probably they did the same joke I did. <laughs> <laughs> For years of planning. <laughs> oh wait, you did books. Oh wait. wait. Oh yes, we should mention this Ken Perel's book. So, do you want to explain what this is, Ken? Yeah, actually, um, this this is coming out in uh, early in 2013, and it's kind of modeled after like the Norton critical editions of famous works of literature, like we have um, a book uh, Moby Dick. Which Moby Dick and all sorts of essays and stuff about it. And I wanted to do something like that for uh, Dan's work. So I put together the Dan Klaus Reader, which has uh, the full story of Ghost World. And it has essays about Moby Dick, which yes. is really yes. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it makes sense. Um, yeah, and then a bunch of short stories, a bunch of comic strips, and then I write introductions to all the stories, and I annotate them, and I wrote four or five essays for it. Essays. And so it's a kind of all-in-one sort of introduction to Dan's work plus critical commentary on it that hopefully would be used in classroom situations but also by general readers and stuff. So look for that in the next story to you. Um, 
that have those different styles. And uh, I can see where, uh, as an artist, that could, uh, could help keep it fresh and new, the, uh, the yeah. story as it goes along. But what do you think it does uh, to the story and for the reader? I mean, you could tell me that better than I could. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, to me, the great beauty of drawing your own comics and having absolute control over everything you do and, you know, lettering and doing all that stuff is that it's all filtered through this one personality. And no matter how disparate you get in the ways you approach it and the styles, it's all kind of brought back into focus by that fact. You know, it's like, I think of it like when you do a watercolor painting and you do an underpainting, you know, that's like all blue and then you paint over that and it gives this sort of a cohesive unity to the painting. And I feel like that, that kind of strength of personality gives it that. And that, that, you know, I have to sort of hope that that's the case because otherwise I'm not sure if it is cohesive, but it's, it, to me it feels like I'm, I'm trying to respond to each moment and each page with its own kind of particular focus that, that applies only to that moment or page. And I think that's, uh, that, that feels right to me in those particular stories. That's the only part of the process I really don't enjoy. It's it's uh, I use like a very old fashioned uh, like an architect's computer program, and I'm, it's like I draw little vector shapes and fill them in, and it's this really laborious, awful way. But it was like the way I first learned to do it on a computer, and I can't. Anytime I try anything else, I just like can't handle it. And it's very it, in a certain way, it's very comforting. Like as boring as it is, at least I sort of know. I, I feel in control doing it that way, but um, I mean that's the one the one beauty of working on computers is the uh, is is the ability to change colors around it. So I tend to to spend a lot of time shifting palettes and seeing how things work in in different uh, you know in different palettes, and you know I, I will go through each page hundreds of times till I get it right. It's a, that's a good part of the process. I said, well, I have a drawing table that I bought when I was 15. That's like this really ugly 70s drafting table and I all for years I thought like I've got to get a really nice like wood drafting table but then I thought like I could never draw comics at any other table than this like I've never drawn a single page at any table but this one and uh, so I have that in my room but it, at a certain point I, I realized like I'm spending a lot of time in this room you know like literally like you know especially in the early days it was like 70 hours a week just like sitting in this room you know churning out the pages and uh, I just decided like I, this room, I should make this room really nice, you know, because it usually was just like stacks of papers and books on the floor. And so I, I have this real concerted effort to like buy nice furniture and like, have my books all set up perfectly so that it feels like, you know, like I have a nicely decorated prison cell. Or <laughs> Actually like outside my studio, I have a, I have a painting I bought that's a, art that some prisoner did in like 1950 and it's like a guy literally a guy like sitting in his cell drawing and it's every time I go in my studio I see that
he's at every camp here, he's asking what, what I intend to do with my original artwork when I, when I pass on. <laughs> Slightly ageist remark. Um, you know, it's, uh, all I think of is, you know, like how will it best benefit my son? You know, it's like I really think like, you know, do I want to stick him with it? Do I want to get rid of it before, you know, I, I have, sometimes, you know, I have this vision of my son at a dumpster just like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd like to maybe avoid that moment, so I don't know. I, it's, not, it's, not, it's one of those things I'm avoiding thinking about.
Yes, no, talk radio, I can tune out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is like a metronome. Um, apart from like Duplex Planet, I can't think of anything you've ever collaborated with in the comics field. Is there any anyone else that you would consider collaborating with? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, that's, to me, the whole joy of comics is that I don't have to listen to anybody else and that I have literally nobody who even sees it till it's printed. Really. You know, it's just that the publisher might might see it, but they have very little to say till it's, you know, till it's way beyond their chance to make any changes. You know, I've never had anybody even suggest any changes to anything like that. And it's, you know, and then working in the movies is the opposite, where it's everything is micromanaged to the nth degree. And that's kind of fun, too. It's fun having people kind of scrutinize every period on the page. You know? But comics is, that's, for me, that's always just my thing. Yeah. Um, in the process of putting this book together, did you sort of rediscover things about uh, about your own work or sort of learn things about your work or yourself that you hadn't thought about before, hadn't thought about at all? Yeah, definitely. I looked at a lot of stuff I hadn't thought about in years. And it's, you know, I've been doing this professionally for over 25 years. And that, it doesn't seem like that, you know. I, I walk around here, you know, in the hall and I look at all these 24 year old guys and I feel like I am just like their age, you know, so you feel like you're sort of the same guy you were back then and, and then, you know, and you think, yeah, I've done a few books and, you know, you, I never look at the books or, you know, I see them on my shelf and it's like this much, you know, that's that's my life is this, you know, like nine inches of space on my bookshelf and, and you start to actually look through it and look at the pages and look at all the stuff and it's kind of overwhelming, you know, so it's like, oh yeah, I really did like sit in this room for years and years and crank out a lot of stuff, you know, and it's, it's uh, in a way you feel, it's, I feel like, well, I've, you know, I've done something, but in a way you feel like, oh my God, I should have, you know, joined the National Park Service or something. <laughs> take a couple more. Um, I got the movie Ghost World, how much uh, input did you have into the, the script and, and what is, could you talk a little about making, being involved in producing a movie from your comics? I, mean, I, I pretty much, you know, I wrote most of the script for Ghost World and it's, but it's, you know, maybe writing a movie is still not being in, in charge at all, you know, a lot of things are changed and, and you know, nothing looks the way you imagine. I'm doing my comics as I'm writing, you know, writing out an idea or something. I know exactly how it's going to look, you know, and I, I can try my best to realize that. And often I fall short, but I at least have that vision of, of what I'm doing. And in a movie, it's always interesting to see how somebody else sees what you're writing very, very differently. Was it uh, Terry Zwieghoff's idea to make Seymour somewhat R. Crumb like or Robert Crumb like? Yeah, he was funny because Terry, both Terry and Crumb see that that character was based on Terry's cousin, who's, huh. uh, who's sort of their role model, I think. <laughs> <laughs> they all talk with the same weird drawl. It's very strange that they're all, you know, it's like they're all like inbred hillbilly cousins or something. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, it's, I mean, all those guys, Terry and Crumb, they all have like the identical little record rooms with the hardwood. Gustav stickly shelves filled with uh, 78s and green, you know, matte paper. And it's just, it's very, it's a strange little world of 78 record collector nerds. <laughs> promotion. <laughs> Alvin gives you the heart cell. <laughs> It'll also be signing a John Gordon. I'm not sure what time, but for now tomorrow as well. And, um, from 
probably take one more question. The pressure's on. When I first saw your work, like when I got the Fantagraphics catalog, I knew that nobody in my town had ever seen anything you ever produced. <laughs> so it's kind of surreal to see your yeah. stuff on like the cover of New Yorker or something like that now. What's the best and worst part about being respectable? <laughs> <laughs> the best part is definitely that, like, if I go to a, like a dinner or something, or go somewhere like with the parents of my son's friends at school, and they ask what I do, I don't have to say like, well, I do adult comics. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> you know, I, all I have to do is have you. That's fantastic. You, you just see them light up. That's a real thing. That's <laughs> And you don't have to say any more than that. And, uh, but you know, there's, yeah, it's, it used to be fun to, to feel like a degenerate <laughs> among the mass populace. You know, now it's, uh, it feels very strange, is all I could say, to, to have people actually know, know who you are, and know, you know, even know this world of comics, you know, to, to have this many people in a room that care about this stuff, is, it's, it was not something we would have ever thought possible back in 1991 or whenever. You know, like I didn't have it figured out. Like the, sort of the goal is to be able to know the character so well that it's not hard at all to write. Like the easiest one ever was Wilson. Like I could just, I could just introduce any subject. Like I could just like Wilson going to buy light bulbs, and I'd have like ten strips if I wanted to. <laughs> and it, without even thinking about it, you know, just would just flow out of my hand practically. But you know. You have to you have to uh, you have to work very hard to get the character there before you start writing. So it's like whenever I feel like oh, I don't know what this guy's going to say, I realize like I don't know what that character is, and I usually start over. Have you been any difficult characters to return to that have developed? Well, sometimes characters are just started as a sort of a cipher, like you know, like Dan Pussy originally was just from having to go to comic conventions back in the late 80s where it was like me sitting next to like Arthur Adams and all you know like, like really successful mainstream guys and it's just seeing their line like down the hall and seeing me like literally not get a soul in the entire day and I'm just so bitter <laughs> you know endure that that it was just like I'm gonna humiliate those guys and have like a mean comic artist guy but then after a while I was like I sort of sympathize with this guy, and I could totally imagine that I could have been him. For, if, if I had only been successful, I would have been him. <laughs> and so by the end of the book, you know, I had a real sympathy for the guy. I think Bill's up. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> He's doing a cut sign.